Chapter 9 is about quadratic equations and an introduction to functions. In section 9.1, we're looking at solving quadratic equations by the square root property. So recall first, how do we recognize a quadratic equation? To be quadratic, it needs to have an x squared. It could have some x terms. Let me even make that a little bit more general. Make it like bx plus c. And it's usually equal to zero. Might even have a coefficient of a. That's the standard form of a quadratic equation. The important part about it that makes it quadratic is the x squared piece. Okay. So far, we've learned one method for solving quadratic equations, and that method was factoring. So for the example right here, we already know how to solve this. We know that x squared minus 25 can be factored as a difference of squares. So to factor into x plus 5 times x minus 5. Uh, factoring is what I was writing. Sorry, when I write and talk at the same time, I don't always write what I want. Okay, by factoring. And then we would continue to solve this by saying, well, if x plus 5 equals 0, then if you just subtract 5 from both sides, you'll get x equals negative 5. Or if x minus 5 equals 0, you're going to add both sides. You're going to add 5 to both sides, and we're going to turn out with x equals positive 5. So we're going to get these two answers, negative 5 and positive 5, by factoring. Okay, there's another way to do this, though. The other way to do this is to use the square root method. So the square root method says the opposite of a square is a square root. So if I can square both sides to get rid of a square root, I can also take the square root of both sides to get rid of a square. So let's start by adding the 25 to both sides so that we can get the x squared by itself. So x squared is equal to 25. Now we need to figure out how to get rid of this square root, and so we're going to do that by taking the square root of both sides. If I take the square root of x squared, I get x. If I take the square root of 25 like it's written right now, I just get 5. But that is not good enough because this equation has two answers, 5 and negative 5. So whenever I take the square root, I need to take both the principal or positive and negative square root. So I do that just by writing plus or minus in front of the square root. So I get both answers, positive and negative 5. So this is the same thing as writing x equals positive 5 and negative 5. Okay? So we just use this plus and minus symbol to say both things in one concise statement. All right. So the square root property, if I have it, uh, x squared equals k, then this has two solutions. x is equal to plus and minus the square root of whatever k was. Okay? So let's solve these. x squared equals 9. So take the square root of both sides. x is equal to plus and minus the square root of 9. I know the square root of 9, so that's going to be plus and minus 3. All right. For the next one, if you take the square root of both sides, x is going to be equal to plus and minus the square root of 7. I can't take the square root of 7, so we're already done with that one. We've got a warning right here to note. Warning, the equation x squared equals 9 has two solutions, 3 and negative 3. But if you just see the square root of 9 written, that's one number. That does not mean 3 and negative 3. Remember, that's the difference between how the mathematical symbol is interpreted and how I would solve an equation or write an equation in English words. Okay, So let's solve a couple more here. x squared equals 12. If I take the square root of both sides, I'll get x equals positive and negative square root of 12. I don't know the square root of 12, but again, I can simplify that. So x is equal to plus and minus square root of 4 times square root of 3. So x is equal to positive and negative 2 square root of 3, just taking the square root of 4, simplifying that square root as we have earlier in chapter 8. Okay. All right, what about the next one? So this would be x equals positive and negative the square root of negative 25. But the square root of negative 25 is not real. So we can say there is no real answer, or no real solution. OK. 
Okay, so no real solutions are answer on this one. I can't take the square root of a negative 25 in the real number system. All right, and let's look at the next one in part C. I'm not ready to take the square root because the r squared is not by itself, so we'll add the 50 to the other side. So that gives me r squared equals 50. Now we'll take the square root of both sides. So r equals positive and negative the square root of 50. That can be broken down into positive and negative square root of 25 times square root of 2. And further, into r equals positive and negative 5 square roots of 2. Alright, so in the next section we're looking at just some more general examples. If I have an equation like this first one here, we're going to make sure that we start by isolating the x squared before using the square root property. That's what we've been doing in the last one. So let's go ahead and subtract our 1 first. So I've got 2y squared equals 50. Go ahead and keep going to isolate that. We're going to divide both sides by 2. y squared equals 25. And now we're applying the square root property, which says if I take the square root of both sides, the square root of y squared is y, equals positive and negative the square root of 25. I know the square root of 25, so I'm going to take it and I get that y is equal to positive and negative 5. Now again, that represents two different numbers, positive 5 and negative 5. And if you're entering those into your computer for an answer, you're going to type them with a comma separating them. There's not a symbol for plus and minus 5. Plus and minus 5 is positive 5 and negative 5. Okay, it's just shorthand. All right, let's look at the next one. So I'm going to add the 2 to both sides, working on getting t squared by itself. So I've got 3t squared equals 7. Divide both sides by 3. So t squared equals 7 thirds. Take the square root of both sides. So t equals plus and minus the square root of 7 thirds. I can't take the square root of 7 thirds, but I do need to continue simplifying it. It's not okay to have a fraction inside of a radical, so we're going to write it as the square root of 7 and the square root of 3. Then it's not okay to have a radical in the bottom, so I need to rationalize this. I multiply by square root of 3 and top and bottom. So my final answer is t equals positive and negative square root of 7 times 3 is 21 over square root of 3 times square root of 3 is 3. So to get this one fully simplified, I had to separate it into the quotient of two square roots and then rationalize the denominator, things we had done in chapter 8. All right. So in example 4 here, we have these, this entire quantity is squared. So this problem is ready for the square root right away. Notice that if you have x plus 5 squared, if you take the square root right away, the square and the square root are going to be opposite operations, so they're going to cancel each other out right away. So I'm going to get just the x plus 5 equals plus and minus square root of 3. Now I need to subtract 5 from both sides, and I'll get that x is equal to, uh, these aren't like radicals, so I can't subtract them from each other, so I'm just going to start with negative 5, plus and minus the square root of 3. Anytime we have a radical, we want to take the last part of the expression if possible. So this negative 5 is just going to go right up there in front of it. And then we'll have our plus and minus radical 3 to keep that on the end there. Okay. The next one is similar. Take the square root of both sides. The square is on this entire quantity. So I'm going to get x minus 7 equals plus and minus the square root of 27. What I'm going to look for next is whether or not I can simplify the square root of 27, and I can. So x minus 7, oh, I'm going to rewrite that, it looks a little weird. Okay, so x minus 7 equals plus and minus the square root of 9 times the square root of 3, separating that 27 into 9 times 3. So x minus 7 equals plus and minus 3 times the square root of 3. 
So this has been simplified, so now we're ready to add our 7 to both sides. And we're going to come up with x equals, again, 7 and 3 radical 3 are not like radicals, so I'm going to add them separately. So I'm going to have 7, just coming right up here, plus and minus 3 square root of 3. They're not like, they can't be added, and the two answers here are 7 plus 3 square root of 3 and 7 minus 3 square root of 3. Okay, those would be the two answers if I wanted to write them separately. 7 plus and minus 3 square root of 3. Okay, let's look at the next two examples here. In the next one, I've got a quantity squared. So I'm going to start with taking the square root of both sides. So that's t plus 5 equals plus and minus the square root of negative 64. But I can't do the square root of a negative. So I know there's going to be no real answer or no real solution. So I can stop right there on that one. No real solution. I can't take the square root of a number that was negative. Or a perfect square cannot equal a negative value. All right, and let's try D. If I take the square root of both sides, I'm going to get P minus 7 equals plus or minus the square root of 0. I can take the square root of 0. The square root of 0 is 0. Plus and minus 0 doesn't really make sense because 0 is neither positive nor negative. So plus and minus 0, they're both just 0. So when I add 7 to both sides, I get 7. 0 plus 7 is 7. There's only one answer on this one. Because it's 7 plus 0 and 7 minus 0, both are 7. Okay. Objective 2, we're looking at problems using the Pythagorean theorem. So let's look at some definitions here. An angle that is 90 degrees is called a right angle. Okay, right angle. If one of the angles in a triangle measures 90 degrees, the triangle is a right triangle. The side opposite of the right angle is the triangle's longest side. That side is the hypotenuse. And the two shorter side are called the legs. So let's label this picture real quick. And the two legs and the hypotenuse are the cross from the 90 degree angle. If I have a right triangle, Pythagorean's theorem applies. Pythagorean's theorem says that if A and B are the legs, so this could be A and this could be B, C is the hypotenuse, uh, this could also be B and this could be A. It doesn't matter which one's A or which one's B, but that one's always C, that C is always the hypotenuse. Then it's true that A squared plus B squared equals C squared for all triangles, all right triangles. And we're going to use that to find the third leg of a triangle. So if I start with 5 squared plus 6 squared, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. This is where our um, square root property comes into play. So we're going to use the square root property to solve for the C side here. So 5 squared is 25 plus 6 squared is 36 equals c squared and 25 plus 36 is let's see 61 and then if I take the square root of both sides plus and minus the square root of 61 equals c now because it's a triangle we can't actually have a negative side length so we'll throw away the negative and we'll just consider the positive in terms of the side length of this triangle so we'll see that the square root of 61 is C. We're just going to leave it exact right there. But I could also get the approximation if we wanted to. The approximation would be, check out the square root of 61 here. It's about 7.8102. 7 7.8102 is the approximate side length of that triangle's leg. Uh, we'll stop right here and start the next example in the next video.